So Lord, I'm going to pray over Dennis, and I'm just going to hope that he, some of his lame jokes get out of the way so we can hear your message. And so, amen. <laughs> Angelica, is that how he introduced you last week? Hey, didn't Angelica do a great job last week? Thank you. That was fantastic. And it was great to uh, be able to celebrate with our son uh, his, uh, whoa, what was it, 30, what was it, babe? What is, I, I can't see from there. Just say it. Thank you. 33rd birthday. Sweet. Sorry, Stuart. <laughs> I love you. Hey, uh, in addition to uh, what we just talked about with the Bluffview fire, 16 families were displaced uh, through that fire. One of those families is a Hilster family. Uh, and again, thank you for your outpouring of love. You can outpour it again while you feed your face tomorrow because Culver's is having a share day. And all the proceeds from their share day uh, from both the Baraboo and the Sox stores are going to go to uh, the victims of the fire. When, when Craig Culver heard that they were doing a share day uh, and that it was going to be 10%, he said no it'll be 25%. So they're going to be donating 25% of their proceeds tomorrow. And then when, uh, this, this is what's so fun about this community. Uh, when, when someone heard that Culver's was doing that, the, the, the individual said, anything that's raised from those two stores, I'll match. So there is now a matching grant, so that, that's the equivalent of 50% of all the proceeds from those two stores going to help uh, families. So, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go grab a double, make it a triple butter burger, you know, and uh, have a great time with that. Hey, turning the page now. Who's ready to learn something from God's Word today? Ready to go? All right. If you have a Bible with, that'd be fantastic, but I, most of my Bibles these days are on my, on my devices, so... Uh, Please feel free, BibleGateway.com, Bible.com, uh, the U version. You can go on our app, and there is, I think there are versions there as well. Bryce, is that true? Are there versions of... I, anyway, you, you, you can find them. So right now, uh, we are in a series uh, on the book of Revelation, and we have just gotten into chapter 2 last week. Angelica introduced us to, to that. And uh, we're going to pick up there. But I want to kind of lay out what our, our big idea is today. And that is, don't let fear have the last word. How many of you have ever struggled with uh, some sort of fear in your life? Maybe it's anxiety, because anxiety is uh, just kind of a, a, a fear that's, that's drawn out, right? Um, and there, there's so much of that going on uh, today. But uh, the... The big idea for today, I want to just get it right out there, is don't let fear have the last word. Fear has a place, right? If, if we didn't have fear, we wouldn't run from danger. The, the whole fight or flight response is, is based around fear. And that's a good thing. But fear can also be our undoing. And so that's why I want to lift uh, this up uh, today, drawing from this passage. So, if you have a, uh, a Bible, then we are looking at Acts chapter 2, and we're looking at four short verses, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, but as we decided during the first service, we are going to extend this into next week. What, what, what did I say? What? 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 I said Acts? Oh, I don't know why I said Acts. <laughs> Revelation. I guess this is just, I, I'm thinking about how long the Acts series went. And uh, so now I'm pretty sure that the Revelation series is going to go at least that long. But, uh, and this is uh, a postcard to a, a church in, in Asia, what is modern day Turkey. <clears throat> Angelica explained this last week. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that... Uh, Last week, Angelica spoke on which, which of these seven churches? 
Ephesus. Great. And you'll see it's down there on the lower left. And this, this whole book of Revelation is addressed to the seven churches of Asia. And they are represented there with those red squares. And this letter was what's called a circular letter. Someone would have ran with this letter and delivered it uh, sequentially to these, these churches. They couldn't just run a copy. Right? This was all handwritten. And so this, this letter would have been the same letter, physical letter, dropped to each one of these uh, villages in, in turn. First at Ephesus, then 35 miles north uh, to, to Smyrna. And that's what we're uh, looking at today. So with that brief introduction, let us... Uh, I, have, you found, have you found it in your Bible? I'm going, to dis, I'm going to display it on the screen as well. But before we go there, let me just ask you, is there a fear that you can identify in your, in your mind right now that you've dealt with? I have, I have a real simple one. Uh, seeing who's seated right in front of me, and I know that she hates spiders, I'm wondering what she thinks about earwigs. Gwen? <laughs> They're not as bad as spiders. They're, they're, they're not as bad as spiders, no. As a, as, as a little kid, as a little kid, there was a fear that, that I had, and I had to learn to not let it have the last word. I would uh, go to bed, and my brother and I shared a bedroom. That was fear number one, uh, because my, my, my brother was seven years older than me, and he always liked to try to get me in trouble. And so, Donald, if you're watching, thanks so much. Um, but uh, he, he, he would say, hey, Dennis, come here, come here. And I'd get out of bed, and I'd start going over to his bed, and then he'd say, Mom, Dennis is out of bed! And she'd say, what are you doing out of bed? You get back in bed, you... Young man, get back in bed. And she'd come storming in, you know, and whatnot. But the, the thing that really got to me was if the closet door was left open, there was a hatch to our attic. It was just a, a scuttle. So it was a hole cut in the ceiling. And then there was a piece of plywood dropped in that hole. But the piece of plywood was five-eighths of an inch too short. And so when that closet door was open, I'm picturing it right now, my hands are starting to get sweaty. Um, there was this slit, and I swore that when, when that closet door was open, I could see eyes peering through that slit. And so as a little boy, I, I, I dealt with that. You know? And it became kind of a mindset, and, and it, it controlled the things that I would do. Have you ever had your fears control what you do? You know, I, I, I would make sure that those doors were closed tight. I didn't want to see it. Sometimes I'd pull a sheet up over my head. I was wondering why I was tortured. I asked my dad, why couldn't he fix that? You know, and like his son, one day I'll get around to it. Um, but but what, what did the trick was I call out for my mom. She'd close the door and then she'd come and she'd sit on the side of my bed and she'd hold my hand and she'd say, let's sing our song. And maybe you'll want to sing it with me. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And in singing that, we didn't let fear have the last word. Because that was the reset button for me. And my mom would assure me that everything was okay. And that Jesus loved me more than anything could ever wish me harm. And that is what is going on in this passage, Revelation chapter 2. Because there was a lot of fear. Let's just jump right into it. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version uh, this morning. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, 
These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you're rich. You know what? I have this on screen. I promised you I would keep that on there. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you're rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Don't let fear have the last word. So what was the fear that was going on amongst these, these believers at, in this, uh, this church in, in Smyrna? A group of, uh, of young Christians, a church probably about the same age as ours, and uh, dealing with some heavy-duty stuff. But let's, let's remember, first of all, that the Bible was written for us, but not to us. And so in order to best understand uh, what the Bible says, we have to understand the, the people to whom it was written, right? And we tried to get inside their mind a little bit. And so... This is the best picture that I could get from the water. Uh, this is from an encyclopedia from the, uh, the late 1800s, about 1880. Um, just a, a pen and ink drawing of the port of, of Smyrna. And one of the things that you notice about, about Smyrna is that it is a harbor town. And in the background, you can see the hills, and those, those hills were, rich, were a rich agricultural area. And because of the richness of that agriculture and this being a harbor town, what happened to all of those crops? They came down into, into Smyrna, the port city, for shipping and, and for trade. And consequently, uh, there was a lot of money that flowed through this town. You can, uh, you can still see it today. This is uh, where a lot of trade took place. A lot of things happened in what's called the agora. Maybe you've heard of people who have agoraphobia. It's, it's a fear of being out in public. And this, the, the, the agora was the public gathering place. You, you could equate it to, uh, I was going to say the mall, but better than the mall would be uh, like, like the Baraboo Square, where everything is concentrated concentrated right there. You would have, have court held here. You would have uh, debates held here. Political decisions would, would, would be made here. Sporting events would be held in this grassy area out here. Here's that another perspective with that grassy area. Here are, are some of the parts of the Agora that have been uh, unearthed and they're, they're, they're working on, on piecing these things together. But you can see the magnificence of what that building must have looked like, right? That you, you know that this is a wealthy town. It's kind of like, again, when you go up to Baraboo, you know that there used to be a lot of money there, don't you? When, when the circus was in town, they built those buildings. They're all masonry construction, and it's a beautiful square. And uh, it's fun to see them revitalizing the, their, their downtown. And those beautiful buildings aren't just right around the square. They, they continue, and they, 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 they spoke out from, from that, that central hub. And if, if there was money in Baraboo, there was a whole lot more money in Smyrna as you can see. And today, uh, there, there are skyscrapers. You can only see uh, a smaller one there. There, there. there are some huge skyscrapers in Smyrna. And that uh, back there is a parking garage dating back to 200 BC where they used to park their camels, apparently. Um, and if you believe that. Uh, no. But, uh, so, so this is a little bit of the, uh, of the background. But why, why is he saying... Uh, to these people then, if, if, if the city is so well off, why does he say, I know your afflictions and your poverty? So here's what was going on. Because 
the, the Christians, although they initially did come from uh, the, the lower class, uh, they, that wasn't always the case, and, and people were starting to come who, who had businesses and whatnot. But as they became Christians, it was increasingly difficult for them to maintain their business relationships. Now, part of the reason for this was that they didn't want to trade in the money that the, Roman, that, that, that the Romans used. If you remember at one point when, when Jesus was asked uh, about, uh, about political uh, alliances, he asked for a piece of money and he asked, so, so who's, who's, whose image is on this? Do you, do you remember that, that story? And they said, well, Caesar's. And, and Jesus went on to say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. So that's what these early Christians and the Jews struggled with because they did not want to give any honor to, to Caesar and so they, they, they would refuse to trade in, in the, the Roman money. Now, Rome... Uh, earlier on, before the Christians, had made a deal with Rome because Rome really valued the, the, the Jewish trade. And because the Jews took exception with their money, they actually had a different coinage that they, they would allow in certain areas where, where there were high populations of Jewish people. Okay? Is, that, is this making sense right now? You, you get it? So, and, you know, money didn't travel as far back in those days as it does today. Uh, so it, it, would, it would pretty much stay concentrated. And this, this went on for a couple of hundred years. Well, so the, the Christians come along, and really Christianity grew out of Judaism. And so as the Romans looked at the Jews, they, they thought, well, these, I, I, I'm sorry, as the Romans looked at the Christians, they, they felt, oh, these are just, these are just the Jews. Business is going to go on as, as normal. But what, what started happening was the Jews started throwing shade on the Christians. And even though the, the, the Jews could do things that the Romans allowed, what they did was they started turning in Christians for what they were doing and getting them punished by the Romans. Makes Make sense? How many of you live in, uh, in the villages here proper? Uh, I, I learned something a couple years ago. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was just inquiring about why some things were different in, on one particular uh, residential lot, and there seemed to be a lot of non-conforming uh, buildings on, on the lot. So I went in and, and spoke with, uh, with our village administrator, and... Uh, and he said, well, would you, would you like to file a complaint? And I said, well, why, why would I need to fire, file a complaint? I, I just informed you that, that there are all these buildings. Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to go take a look? I said, well, we're not going to take a look unless you, you file a complaint and sign it. And I'm like, wait a second. You have ordinances, but you don't enforce them unless your citizens turn somebody in? That that kind of blew my mind. But apparently, smaller villages do this sort of thing because they, they don't want to start policing it because if they start policing it and they are not equal in the way that they enforce it, then they can be brought to task over that. So I'm like, who knew, right? I'm going to go set up a bunch of illegal stuff now. No, just... <laughs> but... but this is the sort of thing that was happening back then. And so although the Jewish people could get away with stuff with the Romans, they'd go and they'd tattle on the Christians, saying, well, do you know what? They're doing this. Now, one of the things that they would do, what was expected of a good Roman citizen, was to pay homage to the Roman gods. That is, pay money at, at the temple. Go to the, the Agora and, and put some money in, in, in the coin box. And when the Christians wouldn't do it, they got turned in. But 
Caesars started getting a big head. And you've heard of the divine right of kings? Well, the Caesars started to believe that they were themselves gods. And they were demanding worship of the believers. And so Domitian was the first one right around the same time as John is writing this book. And the Christians absolutely refused to bend a knee to pay homage to their political leader. And as a result, they were hauled off to prison. And so when John is speaking Jesus' words and he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. That's what that's about. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. So, in other words, the slander being they're, 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 they're sitting there and they're, they're saying things about you. And they're, they're, they're saying that, that, that you hate Caesar. You don't hate Caesar. You're just not wanting to honor him and worship him. I have a question for you. Was, were Jesus and John anti-Semitic? Look, look at this next phrase. I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. What's that about, right? What is that about? Well, what we have to remember is that the word Satan is actually defined as or means accuser. So when, when you hear of Satan, one of the roles that, that he plays is that of an accuser. So some of you know the, the Old Testament book of, of Job. And C, uh, Caesar... <laughs> Uh, Satan walks into the, the, the throne room of God and God, God says, so what, what do you think of my, my servant Job? And Job starts accusing Job of various things. I'm sorry? Satan. Satan. What, what did I say, Caesar? Job. Oh, <laughs> Getting these mad words. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for keeping me straight. Um, and so, so Satan starts accusing Job of these things. Thus the name Satan means accuser or adversary. And so when John, speaking the words of Jesus, says these words, got to get the right slide, but they are a synagogue of this isn't This isn't direct hatred of, of Jewish people for being Jewish, which is what anti-Semitism is. But it's making a statement of what their behavior is like. Now, we need to understand that, that anti-Semitism does have its roots way back. It goes to at least 200 BC with this whole thing about money that I was just describing to you. Because the, the Roman citizenry got pretty ticked off that there was money being coined specifically for the Jewish people. And that's when anti-Semitism started to, to rise up among Roman people. And we have, to, we have to watch that. But we also have to call it out I, I asked, I've asked a few people in our, in our own congregation, what is anti-Semitism anymore? You know, is it simply disagreeing with something that, that a Jewish person says? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that whole mindset. Uh, but nevertheless, if, if you're going to do a deep dive into anti-Semitism, I encourage you to do it. it. It goes way back. But early on, early on, it wasn't Christians who were against the Jews, it was the Jews who were against the Christians. And really, if there's ever going to be a full and adequate healing, there needs to be repentance on, on both sides. But of course, the fact that Jesus was a Jew and that Christians believe that, that he was foretold as the hope of the world in the Jewish scriptures, it's going to be a very difficult thing to, to, to reconcile, isn't it? Because... 
Christians believe that a good Jew will become a Christian, and a Jew believes that no one would ever become a Christian who was a good Jew. So it seems to be at an impasse. That's all. No extra charge, okay? Goes on and says, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you'll suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So, Jesus is predicting that, that, that the situation is, is going to get worse. Ten days isn't necessarily ten exact days, but it's kind of like the way that, that we use a phrase, hey, I'll see you in a couple hours. Now, like if I tell Scott I'll see you in a couple hours, Scott knows that it might be four, you know? Uh, some of you uh, know, know that, that whole trend with, the, with your friends, right? Hey, whatever. Uh, it's been a minute hasn't really been a minute, it's been a month, right? Uh, and here, the idea of suffering persecution for 10 days just means it, it's a definite amount of time. It, it, it's going to have a beginning and it's going to have an end. Hang in there. It's, it, it's not going to be forever. But what I want to point out to you are the three phrases that, uh, that Jesus uh, speaks through the words of John. Going back. I know your afflictions and your poverty. What are these next words? Yet you are rich. He describes again. And then in verse 10, he says, Help! Help! Let me try this. Do what? Anyway. He says, do not be afraid. And then he, he offers these, the, these words of, of encouragement. Could you go down to the next slide for me, please? Oh, look at this guy. It's his day off. Let's give Bryce a hand, helping me on his day off. Thanks, Bryce. We'll get to the bottom of that one of these days. If you could advance to the next slide for me. Someone? Anyone? There. Don't be afraid. Uh, be faithful. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Now, I ask you something. If you're thrown in jail and someone simply says some words to you, like, hey, don't be afraid. Or, hey, you're going to find life. Or, You're going to get a crown at the end of this. Does any of that make a difference? I don't know about you. I guess I have to confess that that, that sort of thing just doesn't do it for me. But what does it? What do we have to remember about this? A couple of things. Number one, who's saying this? Who's writing these words? John. Where is John right now? He's in jail. He's, he's on Alcatraz. I have a picture of Alcatraz that I'd pop up for you right now, but I don't have my thing. He, he's on Alcatraz. He's, he's on this island of, of Patmos. He is, he is totally secluded. If you know that the person who is going through it is offering you this, this encouragement, does that make a difference to you? I know it does for me. If, if I hear someone who has everything neatly wrapped up in a bow in their life and they say, if I'm going through a difficult time, hey, everything's going to be just fine. Or if I know that the person who's telling me, hey, you know what? It's going to be just fine has gone through it, or maybe they're going through it and they are at the end of the tunnel, that's the person that I want to hear from. Yeah? That's what I love, for instance, about recovery groups. Because in, in recovery groups, 
You have people who have been through it and they are there to help people who are going through it. And people who are going through it are helping one another get through it. Follow me? And that's what's so exciting to me about what we're going to start calling around here our connection groups, our small groups. Because like John offering this encouragement through the words of Jesus to, to these people who are going through it, he's going through it. Right now, Debbie and I um, somehow got involved in two small groups. We, we've always said it's good to be in one small group. And uh, I know some of you are in like three small groups. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd recommend one small group, you know. Find your people and, and go deep with your people. But one of uh, the groups that we're in, uh, it's called the fourth quarter. And what I love about this group, everybody in the group admits and knows that they are in the fourth quarter of their life. You know, if you, if you think that, that we have, you know, four score and ten or whatever our number is supposed to be, three score and ten, uh, you, you figure out, what's, what's the last quarter of that? And you live that, that, that time differently, don't you? If you're in the second quarter of life, you know that you're living differently than you did in the first quarter of life. You know when, when you reach half time in your life that, that, that you start to, to regard the time that you spent earlier in your life different than the time that you are anticipating in your life. You're more concerned about legacy than you are about, about building a, a, a fortune or whatever it might have been for, for you. And so when you're in that, that fourth quarter, what's cool for, for Debbie and me, we're in our, dare I still say, early 60s. Um, we're, we're in our early 60s, and we're, we're with some people who are in their 70s. And it's so cool to hear the perspective that they bring to us as we talk about uh, what it means to, to uh, restructure our, our time, what it means to, to, to parent adult children, what it means to, uh, to, to, to consider the, the things that, that we thought were important now, as we consider what things we'll invest the, the, the rest of our lives into. Though, when, when, when you have people who are in the midst of that, it changes everything. Debbie and I have also just started with the Thrive Group because like so many of us in the room, uh, we have friends and, and family that, that struggle with addictions. And we want to know, what it's, what, you know how, how to love well. It's not enough to, to practice tough love. It's not, not enough just to, to, to call somebody out. But what, what, what's, what's in, what, What's important is to be able to, to love those people well, to create a safe environment for them to be able to be understood and to be heard and to express their own fears. And what's so great about this group for us is that we're, we're learning from, from people who, who are further along that road. You see... John said these things, and yes, they, they, they were words of encouragement, but they meant so much more because here's a 90-year-old man who is in jail for leading these people to their faith. And he's saying, hang tough. It's not going to get easy. It's going to get difficult, but hang tough. I know what it's like, but I also know what the dividends are. And you are those dividends. Seeing you, those are our dividends. Seeing the difference that it makes in the lives of others, that's the dividend. And so, don't be afraid. But know that one day you will, you will receive a victor's crown from God as he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Second thing to notice about this. It's John writing, but who's speaking? 
It's Jesus speaking. If you have a red letter Bible, all these words are in red because it signifies that Jesus is the speaker. And what's, in, what's important about that is that, again, similar to, to John, we know that Jesus has gone through it. And the reason we're here in the first place is because of what Jesus has done for us. The Apostle Paul is writing in, uh, in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, and he, he says this, I keep asking the God of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. I think it's really interesting that the word revelation is used there. It's, it's the word apocalypse. And so it, he says, I'm praying that, that the Father will give you the spirit of wisdom and the unveiling, taking the veil off so that you might know Christ better. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably Great power for us who believe. And so, Paul's, Paul's saying, here's, here's the thing that it's not just head knowledge about this, but I'm praying that, that, that the Spirit would give you insight into what it means to have an intimate relationship. He uses the word know, which is the same word that, that refers to how Adam knew Eve. That is, they, they, they had an intimate relationship. And I'm praying that you would know God in a similar way, that you would know Christ in a similar way, that the Holy Spirit would, would enliven you in a similar way. What this says is that, that this is a spiritual thing. It's not just a head thing. And so not only is it important for us to, to find our people to be connected with in a, in a connection group or in a small group, and you're going to hear more about that uh, as, as the fall draws closer. But what's important, too, is to be able to have people with whom you can pray and you know that they will pray for you. Because this is a spiritual thing. This isn't something that you can do on your own. This is something that God does for you. And as Jesus said about demons, those kind only come out in prayer. This, this kind of depth only happens when people and yourself, when you're praying for these things to take place. And so this is what, what we're being called to. And the last thing I want to point out to you about this passage. By the way, this is the first time that Satan is mentioned in uh, in the book of Revelation. And you may know that, that, the, that the person of Satan uh, is mentioned quite a bit in the book of Revelation. So I'm thinking about doing a little primer message, a little, a little starter ne next week on, on who is Satan and what, what is all that about. You, 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 you good with that? I had a bunch of people in the first service say, oh man, we, we really need to learn more about that. And so I thought we would, uh, we would do that. But um, one of the, the, the last things that I want to point out to you is this word that's mentioned twice in this passage, and that is the word affliction. The original uh, word that is translated as affliction, that, that you're going through affliction, uh, a better translation of that word might be this, or is this, tribulation. And there are a lot of Christians who are taught that that if you're a good Christian, you don't go through tribulation, that you don't deal with affliction, that if you have enough, enough faith, everything will go well for you. I just want to point out, just, just as an aside, that here is John, one of the great spiritual leaders of the first century, speaking the words of Jesus, saying, God is going to use this affliction in your life. God's going to bring you to a better place through this affliction, not sucking you away from it, but bringing you through it. In fact, that's the way of the cross, isn't it? 
Jesus said, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. It's not bad to, to, to pray that, that you can get out of suffering or affliction or tribulation. That's, I mean, that's, it's natural for us to want that. But what Jesus accomplished on the cross ended up coming through it, not despite it. And I, I just want to raise that as kind of a yellow or even a red flag warning when you hear people say, hey, you need to have more faith if there's something going wrong in your life. No, you need to have faith if something's going on wrong in your life so that you can walk hand in hand with your Savior through it. And that's it. Next week, Satan. Lord God, I thank you for the privilege of, um, of bringing your word to my friends and family here. And God, I pray that you will continue to work these words in our heart. I thank you for the believers at, at Smyrna who, uh, who went through it and serve as an example for us. God, there's, uh, there's no criticism of this little church as there are of the other six churches. But this, this church uh, just had much to be praised for and much to be encouraged about. And God, some of us here today uh, might be feeling like they are at the end of, of, of the rope. And God, I would pray that this morning, that together we could encourage one another to hang on to your hand, to hang on to Jesus' hand, to, to, to seek the Holy Spirit's comfort and guidance uh, through this time. God, help us as, uh, as we go out into the world to be the church and to bring this hope to those that we come across. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for your attention to God's word. Have a great 4th of July. Stay away from Sandler if he has bottle rockets. Stay away from me if I have bottle rockets. And uh, everything will be good.